Welcome back uh, live here from Berlin, both to everyone here in the room and to our online audiences and, and to all of you online. Thank you so much for your contributions so far. Remember, there's a chat function if you have any questions for this panel as well. We're starting off with the panel that is called uh, Voices, Technologies and Tactics Challenging Dominant Narratives. And I want to just briefly introduce the panel, saying Ray Wong is here, Philip Nubel, Glacier Wong, and Catherine Tai. And then I'm just going to explain a little about Catherine, why we're so happy to have her here, and then she will take it and introduce you in detail to the rest of our panel. Catherine is a PhD student at political science at MIT and a freelance journalist. Her academic research focuses on Chinese internet policies, and dom both domestically and abroad. As a journalist, she writes in both English and German, about the intersection of activism, technology, and politics in China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. She also runs uh, Fernostwerst, Germany's longest running podcast about East Asia and a leading German language newsletter on East Asia. So thank you so much for being here, all of you, and I leave the word to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and also thanks for bringing us here together. Um, it's definitely my first in-person event in a long time, so it's really beautiful to be able to actually sit here um, on the panel. Um, like Magnus already mentioned, um, uh, Ray, this panel includes uh, Ray Wong, Philip Nobel, and um, Glacier Kuang. I, would li I will introduce everyone in more detail before they speak. Um, but before, before, I just wanted to quickly talk about what this panel is about, because um, I think when we talk about uh, China, um, there often is like this focus on like state actors. We talk about US-China relations, we talk about EU-China relations, or maybe we talk about relations between Uzbekistan and China, as if all of these countries were monolithic actors where often people are subsumed under their governments. Um, just the case of Hong Kong itself shows that that's much more complicated. Um, but also within China or Uzbekistan or Germany or the United States, there is often a difference between people and their government and then there is heterogeneity amongst the people as well. And if we just talk about these states as monolithic actors all the time, it also makes it easy to kind of maybe miss um, similarities that exist across borders, such as for instance between underpaid and overworked delivery workers in Berlin and Beijing. So if we kind of go away from this macro, macro perspective that looks at states as the main actors and we go kind of down further to the grassroots, um, that's possibly a way of opening up new perspectives and that's essentially what I hope that we can partially do with this panel. I think another really important perspective in this context is also um, that often when you are kind of at the grassroots and you're not in power, then it might feel like you're kind of going up against like a leviathan, against like big power, be those like big companies or like strong governments that have a lot of power. Um, obviously we'll be talking about the Chinese government and Chinese companies in this case. Um, so that's why I'm really excited for this panel because I look forward to kind of hearing what are different strategies for countering that power, right? How do people find ways of dealing with it? Um, how do they respond to it? And then maybe what kind of consequences can those strategies have? Um, so with that, um, I would like to start out by introducing Glacier Kuang. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, Glacier is a political and digital rights activist from Hong Kong um, and a former founder and spokesperson of Keyboard, Keyboard Frontline, an organization monitoring censorship and digital rights. She's now um, doing a PhD in law at the University of Hamburg. Um, and yes, I'll hand over the floor to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I really look forward to a very interesting discussion because we all like come from very different backgrounds and we have really different understanding of what actually happened even in, within Hong Kong. Like we have very different experience. So I look forward to a very like meaningful discussion. Um, the things that when we talk about narratives, the things that come into my mind is how activists in Hong Kong or campaigners in Hong Kong manage to make use of technology to counteract the narratives that are being proposed by Beijing in the like past few years, especially after the anti-extradition law movement broke out in Hong Kong. Um, I, at the very beginning of the movement, as we heard from previous panel, it was a leaderless movement. There was no decision-making body to tell the participants or different people 
we are going to do A, let's execute it by step A, B, C, D, E. There's no such decision-making mechanism. So the way we all get together and organize the protest or the promotion materials or everything that is actually visible is that we kind of have a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. That is, someone would propose something on a Hong Kong forum called uh, Lin Dang, but it's, it's like a Reddit in the Western context. And people would say, I have this idea of uh, we should create campaign materials in an infographic form. I have the materials, but the problem is I have no idea how to use Photoshop. And then someone would jump in and said, let's exchange contact. I'm a graphic designer. We can do this together. And then they will exchange each other's telegram ID or signal contact with a burner phone and a burner sim, and then they can start working together. And this is how a global campaign of having advertisement on each country's newspaper came about. People were actually contacting each other without knowing who they are and kind of like map out this massive campaign of having an advertisement, a full page advertisement about what's happening in Hong Kong in 2019 all over the globe, in Japan, in Germany, in the US, in the UK. And in this way, we kind of counteract the narrative of the whole movement is simply a riot in Beijing's eyes, and we are basically demanding little brats that are ungrateful to the country. And by doing so, we kind of counteract that narrative and being very successful in drawing global attention to what's happening in Hong Kong. And the tech, the role of tech here is one, to enable the trust among strangers to be built. Like normally you wouldn't work with people in that capacity like for months or weeks on end without actually knowing the person or knowing their working style before because it's gonna be demanding and difficult. But technology somehow gave us that tool to build that trust in order to organize ourselves to make that happen. And so we kind of was able to counteract the narrative in that sense and other ways of doing so it's through like live stream through like crowdsources materials and content and self-organized promotional materials based on those things that i said we're able to counteract and deliver our own causes in the movement at the very beginning there were no unified causes for the movement but i think in a few months time we developed the five demands which is like um the government has to retreat the anti-extradition law. The government has to retreat the definition of riot, of the protest. The government has to set up an independent investigation panel for police brutality. Uh, the government has to release all political prisoners and unarrested under that. And we ask for a genuine democracy and universal suffrage in Hong Kong, and Carol Liam has to step down in a way. And so we were able to generate this narrative to come up with very clear demands instead of uh, just appearing to be like opposing the government for nothing. And we kind of delivered that we have strong and very clear and reasonable demands in response to what happened in the movement in the past few weeks. For example, there were police brutality on the street every day, even though you're just an innocent passerby, you'll get targeted and then police would yell at you, hit you with batons or spray you with pepper spray, or even you would encounter tear gas on a daily basis. And the government was framing it as if it was a riot and we brought it on ourselves. If it's not for the technology that we have as access to or the creative usage of those technology, we will never be able to have the capacity to try to counteract the narrative and in fact we were successful because when on the 1st of July protesters stormed into the legislative council building which is basically the parliament in, in Hong Kong's context the worldwide media was were shocked because this was something that's never been seen on Hong Kong history Hong Kong has always been known as a peaceful protest city. We've never been like aggressive in any ways. Like if you see, if you ever saw the 2014 um, Umbrella Revolution, we were those who were like very obedient. We will negotiate with the police and stay within the areas that were allowed by the police and so on. So when things like that happened in 2019, the world was like, oh, they must be the rioters. But that narrative does not fit into the Hong Kong context because the, the graffiti that happened within the building is actually quite symbolic in a way that 
we have endured so much of social injustice and systematical abuse and oppression. And going into that building that symbolizes all these structures and all these problems is an act of showing that we are done with all of those things. And there was a slogan that's being sprayed on the wall that says, it is you who taught me peaceful protest doesn't work. I think it pre pretty much sum it up for every protesters that are in, that, in there that night, that we have tried systematical ways. We ran in elections and we're being barred from running elections. Elected legislators are being disqualified. And we have exhausted all means. Like I did a lot of lobbying campaigning back then for the Legislative Council, but none of those were effective anymore so that we get into saying, oh, we cannot repeat doing what we knew that's not gonna work. So we tried new ways and then we kinda, be, like, we kinda have to go down the path of use of force and go into like, buildings that are symbolic enough to make a statement that we are gonna make that statement and state this is our narrative, our side of the story. Like, this is not a riot. We are trying to, we exhausted all means and this is what we're trying to do. We know that it doesn't work anymore. That's why we're doing this. And it's like this kind of storytelling in a way, it's very difficult and delicate in a way, even with the aid of technology. Because as I said, like the Western media were so shocked when the 1st of July happened. They're like, are a peaceful protest no more a thing in Hong Kong? But it's entirely not true because the, the whole thing is an act of going into the building, but it's not targeted to any individuals. It's targeted at a building that symbolizes the regime in Hong Kong. And other examples of we use tech to do it is, um, it's, it is a quite controversial example actually, um, there, because in Hong Kong, by law, they're supposed to show that batch number on the uniforms when they're in operations, so that if there are abuse of power, you have a mean to complain, and then you have uh, within the police, they will have an investigation ab about that kind of power of abuse. But in 2019, no officer is basically showing their badges. We don't know who they are and they're all covered up um, and under their uniform. So there are people who started to like do it the other way. We're trying to hold them responsible because they have public authority in their hands and they're supposed to be responsible to the people and responsible for their actions. So people are gathering publicly available data of police officers. And there, are, there were a person who developed an AI facial recognition tool that can actually recognize who was who on site through using AI on the live stream videos that are available online. And this is definitely an ethical like, issue. Like, is that ethical to do so? I don't have an answer. I'm, I'm still struggling to think about that. But this kind of usage kind of shifted the narrative a bit as well. We are no longer the victims of police brutality. We kind of gained a bit of a momentum to try to be able to hold the police responsible for that, for their actions and abuse of power. And I, under, I fully understood it if it's put into European context, the person who was doing this AI facial recognition thing, it's wrong. Because in Europe, you are under a better legal system that is more or less a bit better in terms of holding people accountable for abuse of public authority. But in the context of Hong Kong, it's nearly impossible to do that. No, no single officer being held responsible for the police brutality that it's being done in 2019. And people have to be forced into the way of take the matters into their own hand in a way to try to figure out things that are in with marginally within legal boundaries to do so. And this on one hand like gave us a bit of power to shift the narrative, but on the other hand it brought us another problem of narrative which is of course, again, people from different contexts and different backgrounds would think this is very, very problematic that you use AI against like law enforcement. And another example that I have is um, there, was, there was an incident where 12 Hong Kongers who got on a um, speedboat to flee to Taiwan and they were captured halfway and they were, and they were like sent to China and detained for almost a year, uh, more than a year basically, and some of them are recently released and being mentioned in court. And the issue when they were first captured appeared to be in Beijing's eye, criminals fleeing Hong Kong and being captured halfway and they're now being sent into detention in Shenzhen in China 
and they're doing justice. This is the general narrative that the Beijing government presents the world. But upon further investigation by activists, by a colleague of mine who's Joshua Wang, and with the help of whistleblower within the government, we were able to find out that the police of Hong Kong, the authorities of Hong Kong, are aware of the fact that there would be a speedboat fleeing to Taiwan that night at that time. But they chose to not arrest or act on the fact when the boat is still within Hong Kong's jurisprudence or within their jurisdictions. They chose to let these people go out into like Chinese sea area and then let them capture by Shenzhen officials so that they will be detained in China. So this story came out in Hong Kong and it uh, like 180 degrees shifted the narrative again. But this would never be possible without secure means, fire technology for the whistleblower to provide the information and it wouldn't be possible if we don't have access to free information or free access to the internet or freedom of speech, where Joshua won't have the opportunity to release all those materials and tell the story together with other activists like Owen Chow and so on, it wouldn't be possible. So this is how secure means of technology and access to technology would help us to shift the narrative and disclose truth, basically, what actually happened on that night. And so and for now, like, because there are a lot of prisoners that are behind bars right now and they're basically societally dead. Like they're in black box situations because nobody would know for sure what happened to them because their letters get vetted when they're like writing out. If you, they, if you send them letters with sensitive materials, the letters get censored as well. And basically, if, like, like there are still means to like get the words out, but I'm not gonna say it publicly or I'm compromising their safety and so on. But there are still ways to do it. And they're not, like people still remember them and know what they're doing because they would write down their political ideologies, they would write down what they want and then they will send it out via security means. And they would still be able to post it on the social media so they actually keep updating every day in terms of what happened behind bars to them and how are they being abused for having an extra pack of M&Ms in their possession in jail and so on. So this is how we use technology and the access to technology to kind of kind of help them counter narrative if they are criminals and they deserve being in jail because nobody could hurt for them anymore. And this is what's happening right now. And of course there are other use. I, I have a long list of examples I want to share, but I don't think I can go through all of them. Another thing is we're using technology like blockchain to document what happened in Hong Kong, what's happening in Hong Kong. For example, documentaries from the public broadcasting services are being taken down um, because of like political reasons and there are people who are archiving all of these things and put it on blockchain so that it would be nearly impossible to delete them online and people have access to those documentaries and those news materials so that we still have historical records we can use in the future or now to counteract Beijing's narrative of Hong Kong is perfectly fine, we don't have social problems, nothing is happening, we restored peace and stability to Hong Kong under national security law. So I think I'll just stop here and then let other people continue like put in input and then we can have a nice discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I need to figure out, I have too many notes for this because I was very excited about the panel. <laughs> I want to make sure my introduction is to everyone justice. Um, so we're going to move slightly geographically um, from Hong Kong and for that I would like to welcome Philip Nobel. Um, he grew up in Soviet Uzbekistan and then studied in Prague, Paris, Tokyo and Beijing. Um, he's now managing editor at Global Voices, which is a citizen journalism platform focused on human rights and freedom of expression. Before that, he worked in China for 10 years as a trainer for, among other things, freedom of expression and online libel. So also very interesting background and Philip will be talking to us about um, the Belt and Road and how people react to that and deal with it. So warm well, welcome to Philip and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much for this introduction and thank you uh, for the organizers for Disruption Lab for creating this amazing platform and also for the audience both in person, which as we said is a real privilege <laughs> those days, and also uh, online. Um, before I start, I really want to say how much I appreciate the fact that I'm sitting on a panel that is focusing on narratives because when I was working in uh, Beijing for 10 years, 
obviously I used to go to Hong Kong for, for different uh, activities and the narrative in Beijing, not just within the foreigners community, but also with the Chinese intellectual community, and I quote, uh, Hong Kong uh, is politically dead, nothing happens there, uh, it's a very boring place, it's all about money. And that was the narrative that we were kind of, you know, uh, brought again and again as a person who had never lived in Hong Kong. Uh, the first time I remember uh, I went to Hong Kong, I had this actually, uh, you know, false narrative in my mind. And so I think that when we're talking about China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, it's really important to actually use the form of narratives because we see that this is a very good approach to uh, keep ourselves questioning and challenging the knowledge that we have and not to be stuck, I think, in sort of like fixed position of China is this and that, Hong Kong is this and that, because things shift over time with geography and I think that that's why I like the, the term narrative. So today, actually, I would like to talk about a project uh, that I had the privilege to lead that is still going on with uh, Global Voices. Uh, as was explained, uh, this is a citizen uh, journalism platform where we work uh, in over 40 languages to really understand the local context. And this is what I want to underline uh, with this platform is that uh, it's not about the foreign correspondent being dropped and you know, within a week thinking, I got it all, let me write a story. That's not how we work at Global Voices. We actually work with people who speak the local language, who are from there, and who tell us precisely how they see it uh, from uh, their own perspective. So, uh, with uh, maybe uh, the slide number two, uh, I will just make a very, very brief I can't even really call it a historical review because you know that when you're talking about Chinese history, you need five hours to just scrap the surface. Uh, but uh, obviously, I think that what is interesting to think about is to what extent China, and here I'm referring to the People's Republic of China, has what I would argue a very conflicted relationship to uh, global visibility. So again, no lecture on Chinese history, but I think that even within the sort of late 20th century and of course 21st century, we see that the PRC has moved from a policy and I would argue an attitude of non-interference observation, I'm simplifying obviously, there are details, to what is now called the Chinese century, uh, the China dream, China being assertive, being present. And I think it's really important to keep this uh, frame, which happens to be also a narrative. We were out of the world, says Beijing. Now here we are, deal with us because we're here to stay. And I think this is a, a very important uh, a moment. Uh, if we go back in, in, in Chinese history, of course, we see that most of the time, China was not really present physically with its people and projects, even though, you know, uh, in the sort of uh, Middle Ages, uh, the term project is probably not very appropriate, but, you know, um, there was a bit of an episode during the communist uh, period uh, in terms of uh, sort of uh, coming turn uh, solidarity. Some of you know that, for example, China supported very much Albania in the 70s, which we could argue was maybe a premise of the BRI in terms of sending expert money uh, training people. Uh, so just to finish on the historical thing, I want to uh, remind us about some of the key definitions of the Belt and Road Initiative or, or the BRI. It was mentioned uh, sort of publicly at least, because we don't always have access to all the archives or the closed door meetings in 2013. And then there was a white paper that was very public and much more detailed in 2015. And I think a key date, if you have to remember just one date, is really 2017 when the BRI was actually uh, inscribed in the Chinese constitution. Uh, and so again, this is a narrative that tells us that the BRI, as is sometimes, I think, wrongly assumed, is not just an economic program or project, it is, some people will argue, actually a replacement, uh, simply put, of China's foreign policy. Uh, we might agree or disagree, but I think that this is really important to understand that the BRI is a huge thing. So, uh, with the next slide, uh, I think that uh, precisely because uh, it is complicated, uh, to put it mildly, uh, 
uh, I think that we, if we want to have interesting conversations about the BRI, we have to really look for nuance. And that is actually a challenge. Uh, I'm sure, uh, regardless on how close you are uh, watching China or not, and depending on the country where you are, uh, very often we see two very opposite narratives. One is success, called win-win, uh, in, in many of the literature uh, and, and the, art, the media content. And the other term, uh, and I purposely use an extreme word, is uh, basically the BRI is a form of Chinese colonialism. And so very often in discussions and analysis, people usually are kind of into very opposed camps. Uh, and as we know, uh, life is messy, nothing is really black and white. It's pretty much in the gray area that uh, it is uh, interesting. Uh, and that sort of uh, situation has created uh, a place where we very often have either tales of success, and I really use sometimes the term of fairy tale because I think that when you read certain reports and certain statements, it's like the world is perfect and you know, X project like was uh, close to a miracle. Uh, or of course, uh, quite uh, the opposite. Uh, one very quick uh, observation is that uh, it's important to uh, remind, especially non-Chinese audiences, that there are critical voices of the BRI within China but China being a space uh, and, and a society where there is heavy censorship, uh, and I had you know, very interesting conversations with a lot of Chinese uh, public intellectuals who privately, of course, had questions about the BRI, uh, but you cannot express those. So we shouldn't uh, look at the Chinese voice in a very monolithic way. It's much more uh, nuanced than that. So I think that, again, to go back to the conversation, if we can go beyond those statements uh, and those uh, magic expectations that the BRI will you know, save a society or actually destroy it, then we get uh, to uh, an interesting place. So with the next slide, I would like to briefly explain how we at Global Voices uh, developed a methodology to precisely come to the concept of BRI without any preconceptions and look at what is being told about the BRI locally in the local language, uh, in, the, in the local context. So we basically uh, did that in three uh, kind of steps. The first one is the items, uh, and I will explain uh, what we mean by information items. The second one, second step basically in, in, the, in the research was that uh, we were able to have uh, narratives emerge and discuss them, and I'll spend more time uh, discussing that. And finally, we produce uh, stories because we are, after all, uh, a media outlet. So with the next slide. So this is uh, basically what we call um, 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 an air table. Uh, I don't know if, if you're, all of you are familiar with that, but it's a database where you can basically input a lot of content related to information in different languages, scripts, uh, and formats. And as I said, we came without any pre uh, sort of a concept of what we should be looking for, but actually what is available. So uh, a media item is anything that is part of a media ecosystem. And I will give you some examples, and some are, are quite interesting, to show that we really looked at everything uh, possible. Uh, so of course, it can be an article uh, published in the mainstream media. It can be a 100-page report by a think tank. It can also be a YouTube song about the BRI. And believe me, there are many of those. Uh, it can be a tweet or a Facebook post, a Weixin comment, a TikTok video a photo of a poster, a podcast, uh, a YouTube video of a police raid in a karaoke bar targeting Chinese businessmen, that's a real story, uh, an anti-Chinese poem written by villagers uh, in Kyrgyz, it can be a statement uh, from the local uh, Chinese embassy. And so we looked at all those items, that's the term that we use because as you can tell, it's, it, it comes in different shapes and forms, in over 15 languages from Amharic to Russian to Turkish to Czech to Kazakh. And based on those items that we can consider as little bricks, we see emerging patterns. We see things are being repeated. And again, from the win-win pole of the BRI to the 
it's a form of Chinese colonialism uh, poll. So the idea is really to focus uh, on perception uh, and to identify two things. I think that that's the, the most important part of our research is what people talk about when they relate to the BRI and even more importantly, how they talk about issues related uh, to the BRI. Um, so with the next slide, I would like to focus a little bit uh, on the narrative. And uh, of course, you know, as uh, part of a research team, we had a lot of conversations on, you know, what is common also across countries, what is unique to specific countries. But there are probably four uh, narratives that I think uh, I would like to mention in passing uh, that I think are not necessarily very well covered uh, in mainstream media all over the world, not just in the West, but also uh, on different continents. So the first one is uh, elite capture, which is of course a term uh, quite fashionable right now. Um, but I think that what we saw uh, and we worked, I forgot to mention, in Latin America, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Europe, uh, and also uh, in Asia, is that obviously the way BRI was conceived, conceived from a Beijing perspective is that you need to have the support of elites. Uh, they can be economic, political, they can, they, they, they can uh, combine uh, both. And so a lot of emerging patter patterns uh, were discovered through this research. For example, that very often the local elites uh, share the same practice of curating favors for benefits uh, and bypassing, for example, uh, legislation. Uh, another interesting pattern is that there can be a political instrumentalization uh, of the BRI. If you think of Hungary and its relationship with the EU, or Venezuela and its relationship to the US, uh, the China element becomes really interesting. Uh, there is also a new creation of uh, um, elite that speaks Chinese, that has been educated in China, and that, that creates a sort of strong support for the BRI. One key consequence of this elite capture is that actually very often you have what we would call media silence when traditional media uh, basically censor themselves uh, on anything critical uh, about China. Uh, and that has a very negative consequence in terms of narratives that the only space where you can discuss probably more openly uh, you know, perceptions and mi misperceptions of uh, the BRI becomes social media. The problem with social media, as we all know, that it's very little regulated, if any, and it then can also develop uh, hate speech. And unfortunately, including in the previous panel, we know very much how uh, Asian people and Chinese people, regardless of their citizenship, have been the victims because there is basically, you know, an amalgam of China, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, and Chinese people. And so suddenly, because you are ethnically Chinese, regardless of your background, you are perceived in narratives as representing all of that, which of course is not uh, true. Uh, the second uh, maybe uh, interesting narrative is that there are also pockets of resistance uh, to the BRI. And just sort of in passing, because uh, my time is almost up, uh, we discovered in this research that uh, people who are resistant to the BRI in, in different continents very often use three arguments, nationalism, uh, environmental activism, but also again political uh, instrumentalization because you can also play the card of China against China to gain support in your constituency. And so this is also something uh, <coughs> interesting. Uh, finally, uh, the third maybe uh, narrative that I would like to mention is why Beijing often fails in its communication efforts on the BRI. And I think that, again, we see three recurrent patterns. Uh, one is that there is a really bad management of expectations. A lot of BRI projects are announced in a very grandiose way. Some of them do happen. Others don't, but when they don't, there is very little explanation of why. So you come and create a lot of expectation uh, and then people uh, are, can be uh, disappointed. Uh, 
Another thing is I think that uh, as uh, very often with Chinese official uh, language, there is no space for criticism or feedback. It's not going back uh, to the source. So, uh, very quickly, if we can move maybe to the f almost final slide. Uh, we have, through this work, created about 35 stories in English uh, with a lot of translation and more is coming, including uh, in Simplified Chinese, where we precisely look at Ethiopia, Nigeria, Egypt, Turkey, Brazil, Peru, Venezuela, Cambodia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Myanmar, the Philippines, Uzbekistan, the Czech Republic, uh, and Greece. Um, and um, we will have a full report uh, on this research coming out uh, in the middle of October, which will be accessible uh, and uh, on our website. One more slide. Uh, as I started uh, by saying that I think that uh, if we get stuck in sort of very solidified positions on what is the BRI, uh, we don't really have interesting conversations. So I would never uh, you know, think that it's a good idea to conclude on China uh, or to announce uh, things. But I think that uh, what is more interesting is to ask the next questions. And so the next question on is Beijing really listening when people are talking about the BRI in different contexts? I think that we must recognize three things. China made a bold move to be in the world uh, after many centuries of uh, self-imposed isolation. But China does not really adapt its policies that have, from a Beijing perspective, proved to be successful domestically they are not adapted enough, at least, to a different a foreign uh, environment. And this is where I think a lot of the problems uh, start. Uh, and finally, as I said earlier, I think that China needs to live and accept that, of course, it is now a superpower. So with the superpower comes the fact that you get a lot of visibility and with visibility, criticism. And you have to get used to take in criticism and to be able uh, to respond. And the final slide is just to say thank you. Thank you so much. Again, that was a perspective that you don't often hear, so I um, imagine this is going to be a great resource for people who are interested in reading further about this as well. Um, last but not least, um, on this panel we have Ray Wong. Um, he is a Hong Kong activist, a founder of Hong Kong Indigenous, and was a few years ago famously the first Hong Konger to be granted asylum in Europe, um, something that has become um, much more common in recent years. Um, now he is a student in Germany, um, is currently founding an NGO, and is an editor of Flow, a Hong Kong diaspora magazine. So. With him, as for everyone, I can't really list all the things that they're doing because everyone in this panel is incredibly busy. But without further ado, um, please, Ray. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer to yeah, invite me to speak here. Um, also, if there are uh, anyone who has been to the uh, film discussions also organized by Disruptions Network Lab and watched the documentary, you would probably know that um, me, Ray Wong, is a pretty um, introvert person. So every time when I speak in front of so many people, I would get nervous. So I first um, prepare a short introduction to, yeah. Let me relax a bit. So, <laughs> um, before I start my presentation, I think it would be better for me to make a remark on the language I'm going to use. So first of all, when I say China, what I'm referring to is the party state controlled by the authoritarian regime. I'm not saying all the Chinese people are part of this authoritarian regime. I don't think all of them support this authoritarian regime. And secondly, when I say Chinese and Hong Kong, I don't distinguish these two groups based on the ethnicity, but rather based on our subjective perceptions and our value system. So, um, yeah, this is a short disclaimer. Um, 
I founded the political party Hong Kong Indigenous shortly after the Umbrella Revolutions in 2015. For most of the Western, uh, I think when you look at uh, umbrella revolutions, you may think, oh, this is a democracy movement, Hong Kong people fighting for freedom and our rights. That's true. But for us, Hong Kong, uh, um, the umbrella revolutions is more than that. I would say the failure of this movement to fight for the democratic electoral reform that was promised in our mini constitutions, basic law, also means that we could no longer hold the belief that under one country, two systems, our way of living, our values, and our rights that we treasure could still be protected. And I think after the Umbrella Revolution, it was time uh, for us to re-examinate all of our previous uh, perspective, our own narratives. And in this, in this presentation, I would like to say that sometimes we are the victim of the um, dominant narratives given by our enemy or by our opposite side. But also, in the case of Hong Kong, we could also become the victim of our own narrative. Um, so, I would first uh, address the uh, dispute between young people and the, the traditional pan-democrat on the issue of our strategies and also our own understanding of the Chinese Communist Party. And at last, I will talk about um, the very nature of uh, politics, namely the identity. So let me begin with a strategy. As Glaciat has mentioned, um, I think before the anti-extraditional movement, but I would say actually before the 2015 localist movement, um, most of the Hong Kong people, um, I would say, dramatically stick to the doctrine of non-violence. Even we would go so far that some uh, politicians, some organizer would accuse people who don't apply to their definitions of non-violence. Let me give you an example. During the Umbrella Revolution, some of the protesters uh, wanted to expand our occupations into the Legislative Council, exactly like um, uh, what Taiwanese student did in the same year in the Sunflower Movement. But at that time, a lot of um, the organizer, the leadership of that movement accused those protesters, mainly young people, that saying that, oh, actually they are sent by the Chinese Communist Party and they wanted to mess up our non-violence um, movement. Their rationale is that only through non-violence means we could gain support from the general public. I support that, of course. The more support from the general public, the more powerful we are. But as I said, once we have gone so far to the extent that we blindly stick to this belief, this doctrine, it becomes toxic. This idea could neither effectively pressurize the government nor able to unite um, our camp. So a lot at that time, a lot of young people were very discontent with the leadership of the umbrella movement, uh, or some may call it uh, umbrella revolution. Um, I was among them. We think when we look at the uh, occupation sites in Admiralty, we could see um, the government 
basically just sends a few police to the site and then, yeah, nothing happened there. And also at that time, a lot of young people, they don't want to just sit there. They know if we don't do something more, we will lose this fight. And so this divide between the old pandemic and the uh, young people began from this point. Um, the second point I would like to address is that before the umbrella rev uh, revolution, the focal point of the pandemic was that once we uh, successfully gained the democratic electoral to be formed for Hong Kong, then we are safe from the uh, intervention or interference from uh, China. And actually it was their uh, main objective to uh, fight for the uh, democracy in Hong Kong. But after the umbrella revolutions, due to the H3 round proposal, we realized that, okay, um, under the rule of um, the Chinese Communist Party, it's near impossible to have genuine democracy in Hong Kong. So, what next? We have lost a perspective uh, as in the further development of the civil society and also the resistance movement. A lot of pandemic and also the general public at that time believe that um, the Chinese Communist Party is opening itself and through the engagement with the West and through the influence or um, the uh, work from uh, Hong Kong people, we made uh, democraticize uh, China and China will eventually become a democratic, open society with respect of human rights. I would say it was partially true uh, in uh, one uh, era before Xi Jinping. But after Xi Jinping came to power, we have witnessed a drastic change in China. Uh, they banned a lot of uh, civil society organizations. They take a harder measure in uh, minority areas such as Xinjiang, uh, Tibet, and also they introduce some uh, uh, new policies to degrade local culture. For example, uh, they uh, there was attempt to degrade Cantonese, this uh, uh, language uh, used in Canton in this area. So, <sighs> I need to drink water, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So, with all this um, understanding of the Chinese Communist Party, the pandemic, uh, or not only the pandemic, the whole movement basically got into a perspective vacuum. On one hand, we realized that our previous perspective uh, is no longer uh, suitable or applicable in the reality. On the other hand, we didn't know what to do. So a lot of young people uh, start to question some fundamental questions. For example, why do we, why the current uh, political arrangement of Hong Kong is one country, two systems? Did Hong Kong people participate in the negotiations? Did we have a say during the negotiations of the Sino-British Joint Declaration? No. We were even, Hong Kong was even taken out from the list, uh, uh, from the list on UN, the colonial uh, list. And secondly, why 
are we Chinese? Because back then, the Hong Kong government would keep using the official Chinese nationalism to convince Hong Kong people that, yeah, uh, as we are all Chinese people, there is a bottom line that we shouldn't cross, uh, such as um, one country, over two systems, we should never think about the possibility to be an independent country as such. And we see the uh, limit uh, imposed by this narrative that, yeah, we are Chinese and we didn't really relate ourselves to Chinese people. That might sound one-sided, but as a Hong Konger who was born and grown in Hong Kong, our understanding of Chinese people is very different from the image or from the picture the Hong Kong government try to portray to us. And culturally, um, historically, and also politically, we think differently. So why do we uh, think, or why should we identify ourselves as Chinese? So with all these um, questions in our mind, uh, a lot of young people um, uh, gave some new proposal, for example, a group of Hong Kong uh, students from the Hong Kong University wrote a book called Hong Kong Nationalism, in which they emphasize the um, speciality of Hong Kong. Uh, we are a special group, we are a unique group, because we have our own culture, language, history, and value system, and we shouldn't buy the narrative uh, from the Hong Kong government and also from the uh, Chinese government. And motivated by this line of thinking, I found that Hong Kong indigenous, and I, um, and uh, with my colleagues, we participated in elections. We hope to, through the elections, through this platform, to spread our ideas and we organized protests. We broke the rule of non violence. We were not really violence. I won't say I, I, I'm a, a really a violence guide. I <laughs> what we actually wanted to do is to um, increase the cost for the government to uh, stable, uh, to remain uh, or to sustain a stable society, and we just want to uh, give them higher cost. So um, after two years of my activism, uh, the Hong Kong government realized that, oh, uh, this group of young people to grow very rapidly because in one of the by elections, actually the only elections we are allowed to participate in, uh, we gained 15% of the votes from, uh, uh, that in that, from that constituency and for a group of inexperienced and obviously I'm a, not a really typical activist type of person and we achieved that. So we were targeted by the um, Hong Kong government and that's why I was charged and I needed to flee Hong Kong. Going back to uh, challenging narrative, I have gone too far, I'm sorry. Um, Going back to your challenging uh, narrative, yes, uh, it's very important to um, examine the narrative in our society, regardless of the origins of this uh, narrative. But sometimes we should also re-examine uh, the narrative that we have already adopted and this driving force, this driving narrative behind our actions, and as my party has uh, 
contributes into the change of the uh, narrative in the um, resistance movement in Hong Kong, we could see the movement evolve in a very different way. The protester got more creative. They think out of the box, and we dare to think a new possibility for Hong Kong, namely Hong Kong independence. And I, I'm, I, I know that um, some people may find this idea naive or impractical, but um, we cannot uh, deny that this kind of conversations does facilitate a lot of discussions among people and this the content of all these kind of discussions is the most important part for the development of a society. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, for moving into discussion, I'll start out with uh, one or two questions that I have and then we'll also be taking questions from the audience later on. Um, but kind of following up on um, the very diverse and different approaches that we've heard, um, one thing that strikes me is that there's through this through line of different types of stories that are being told, but they're told to different people. So Glacier, you were mm -hmm. talking about, for instance, like um, this uh, really big ad that Hong Kongers used to essentially describe what was going on and kind of explain themselves. You were talking about how Beijing doesn't really seem like they're listening. And Ray, you kind of talked about how the audience for the new narratives um, or maybe even a new utopia in Hong Kong was very much um, society itself, right? So activists themselves. So I'm, one thing I'm really curious about is in challenging actors that are often stronger state actors, um, who do you think are the most important audiences? And maybe also do you see in um, the examples that you've used, maybe sometimes um, should people from the grassroots have spoken, tried to speak to someone else, that they maybe address the wrong actor? I, I, I go first. I, I think um, political movement is about a fight for narrative, basically, especially in activism in the context of Hong Kong, no matter it's against the narrative that Beijing wants us to fit in or among the so-called like pro-democratic camp as Ray has kind of described a bit of the tension behind all of these developments of a broader spectrum and so on. But basically, it's the development of a society has always been about overwriting old narratives and trying to fill it in with new, ground, more groundbreaking narratives and then widen the spectrum and then give us new ways of thinking things. So when it comes to audience, I think the first audience you have to convince is yourself, because if I'm not convinced by like what Ray said about localists or about uh, new pandemics and so on, if we're not convinced ourselves about what we're doing as activists, then we will never be able to tell a compelling story that we can convince you to join our fight for freedom and democracy for Hong Kong or for other places in the world. And after I convince myself, then as an activist, we are trained to strategize who to talk to, to maximize the impact with the, minim the minimal resources that we usually have. S different activists have different approach of deciding who's the most important actor like based on their profile. Like for example, I, for me, I work in, like I'm a, a really bad researcher at the time being, but I'm still researching. So my, I would like would try to reach out to people from my field when it comes to my activism. It's like, oh, the digital rights community, people working on tech, people working on privacy policy, people working on uh, open data, those kind of things, because I kind of speak the language more easily and I can tell them, oh, this European Digital Marketing Act actually have an impact on access of technology for places around the world in Burma and Hong Kong and so on. So that, this comes quite natural to me because of my training. But for Ray, I think he has a very different group of audience in his circle because he's a different kind of activist and he's trained in a different way. And when it comes to, for example, like an election campaign that we talked about, it varies diff in different elections as well. For the Bai that Ray spoke of in 2016, that Edward Lung ran when like won 15% of the vote. The, the voters 
are like Hong Kongers in a different context than the ones that are participating in the primaries in 2020 in Hong Kong. So how we convince them with a different narrative about an election is different because in 2016 the narrative that was being told is Edward Leung represents a new type of resistance in the Legislative Council, which is a very normal election narrative, even though Edward represents, or HAI in general represents a very provocative idea in the LegCo in Hong Kong. But in 2020, when we we're planning for the primaries and for the LegCo election in Hong Kong that was canceled and then the system got reformed, which is no, no longer democratic at all, the narrative we told is no longer this is the candidate that's going to bring you change in Let's Go. We're talking about send these people in because they are ready to commit figuratively suicidal acts in the Legislative Council so that we can paralyze the government and so on, and which they all got arrested and convicted, like not convicted yet, but they're going through trials of the national security law. So the stories that we try to convince ourselves first and then convince the others are really very different. So it really like varies when it comes to context and what kind of situation we're in and what we're trying to do with that very specific campaign or activism act, I'd say. Philip, maybe a perspective from... Uh, thank you for the question. I think it's when we talk about narratives, we very often also forget you know, the audience and it's key. Uh, and I, I think I want to just mention one a quick example to show that when Beijing is not paying attention to the different audiences and kind of thinking it's all monolithic, even from a um, Beijing perspective, it becomes a lose-lose. Uh, and so in January of this year, uh, I was lucky to, to be back in Kyrgyzstan where I spent five years uh, living and working uh, with a French journalist who was also looking uh, at the BRI. And we went to this place very close to the Chinese border, a small village called Atbashe with probably like 5,000 people living in there. Uh, and the Chinese government, uh, with the support of the Bishkek, the capital of Kyrgyzstan elite, uh, made a deal that the Chinese government and Chinese companies w would open what they called, uh, quite mysteriously, a logistic center, which we understood could be a custom center or something. Uh, and this was uh, presented uh, and promised with like heavy investment, uh, employment opportunities for the local population where you know the living conditions are pretty rough, to say the least. Uh, this project has been hanging in the air for now over almost a decade. Why? Because a group of villagers in Adbashi whom I met, who are really not activist type, they're really local, you know, uh, inhabitants of a mountainous, very harsh climate uh, um, location, use the card of nationalism uh, to sort of play out against both the Bishkek elites and saying basically, you know, I quote them, the Bishkek government is very corrupt, they engage in corruption with Chinese officials, and we're going to defend our land. And what is really astonishing, and we wrote a story about this so you can read it, is that when you think that the power of China, of Chinese money, the support of uh, Kyrgyz national government are stopped by a dozen of villagers because they're using an even more powerful narrative that goes back to actually on the cultural side on uh, the epic called the Manas, which you know is the longest sort of epic uh, that is still remembered by, by the Kyrgyz people and recited over time, in which there are elements of a Chinese territorial invasion and fight. So by opposing a very old narrative from the Middle Age, you are still able until until now to freeze you know, Chinese investment backed by a government. And to me, this is a typical example of how narratives are extremely powerful. And if you don't pay attention, I'm talking about Beijing, you will run into difficulties, even though you assume that it will probably be very smooth, so. Thank you. I actually yeah. have a different question that I wanted to ask okay. you directly, if that's okay. Because um, I think um, also, Building on what Philip was just talking about, there's this um, really strong mobilizing potential of uh, stories and narratives, and that's also what you were talking about. 
But I also think there's one thing where we maybe see parallels between the different things that we're talking about, but um, especially Hong Kong indigenous and localists have also been accused of dividing with like the strong focus on Hong Kong identity. Um, so I think especially when you choose to use such a strong localist narrative, do you think there is actually potential for solidarity out across borders, outside of Hong Kong, possibly with people um, in China, even people who might identify as Chinese, um, or people in other parts of the world, such as Belt and Road countries? Yeah, um, actually it's my answer would also to be related to your previous questions. So um, when it comes to our audience of the, the narrative, I think it's very much depends on the uh, teleology, um, what objective we want to achieve. And in the case of Hong Kong indigenous, uh, first of all, it's why we uh, have this localist narrative is because we are witnessing uh, the Chinese government is using its own Chinese nationalist uh, narrative to replace our uh, in, in Implicit uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, identity. That's why we emphasize and we hoped through which we could reconsolidate our own identity. And then, why, if you ask me, why identity is so important in this in this fight? I would say it's because, um, as. Hong Kong is not a democracy. There is no way for us to uh, materialize our own values to protect our culture. In Germany, in other democracy, is uh, different because uh, in Germany you have uh, the idea of uh, constitutional uh, patriotism. Uh, you formed a political attachment to the uh, neoliberal democratic uh, constitution and these constitutions materialize your value and your culture. But in Hong Kong, we don't have these constitutions, so we need to um, embody everything, our culture, our language, and our values in our identity, and to, combat, uh, to fight against the Chinese narrative is the fight uh, to protect our own values. And it, when it comes to um, solidarity, um, to be fair, I would say it at that time, uh, a lot of localists uh, didn't do very well in this regard. But as I said, we with groups of young people, inexperienced young people, we just wanted to do something, and we saw there is an issue, very uh, real issues uh, from the China side. That then we react on that. That's why. It, um, at that time, uh, even till now, quite a lot of people may think um, this localist narrative is very exclusive. We exclude other Chinese people to join our fight. But I actually repeatedly um, made my point um, as written in the, uh, the book written by, by the group of uh, Hong Kong youth students, uh, we distinguish our identity. We identified ourselves based on values instead of ethnicities. Whoever uh, identified it's, uh, himself or herself as a Hong Konger, uphold our values, protect, uh, preserve our cu culture, could be a Hong Konger. So I, I think um, we didn't make it clear on this point, so a lot of people think we are exclusive. I see, yeah, so maybe also a matter of communication and thinking about how you're talking to different audiences. Is it okay if I ask another question, or should we, okay. Um, so, um, I actually also, this builds also on this, what we were just talking about, and um, something that Philip also mentioned when you said sometimes um, people get attacked or lumped in as Chinese because of um, how they look and how they're perceived. And the, like, the thing about strong narratives is that they can bind people together really strongly and can create this like trust and 
um, power, but they can also get out of control. You were talking about how we can become victims of narratives as well. So I'm curious, especially coming from the grassroots and from the bottom up, what do you do when these things get out of control? When there is such a strong narrative maybe of opposing Chinese um, companies in a particular country and that's something that gets unloaded um, on Chinese citizens who are just working there, right? And um, Or in the, uh, similar in the case of Hong Kong, there's been accusations of um, violence between protesters and people from mainland China. So I'm curious, is there a good way of reining that in as well? Or how do you, how do you work with that? What do you do? <laughs> So maybe let's begin to, uh, by me. Um, after all this year being uh, accused by uh, uh, my fellows from the other camp, also by some outsider of being um, uh, right wing, I realized that um, it's very important for the uh, activists and organizers who create a narrative and then this narrative just um, heads to, uh, towards uh, unwishful uh, directions. Mm -hmm. And these uh, organizers and politicians should uh, dare to reframe or to modify their own narrative so that the um, the, the uh, people who adopt this narrative would not head to uh, a wishful way. And in the case of uh, Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong indigenous as, uh, in particular, um, at first, some of our supporters, some of our members did use some uh, very radical sometimes even discriminate uh, Chinese people, this kind of language. But uh, after Edward Learn joined the party and he himself was born in China, and one of our objective is to divert this sentiment against uh, Chinese people to uh, against this structure instead because we come to realize that um, a lot of Chinese people, why they behave in a way that a lot of Hong Kong uh, dislike is because of the system. And sometimes when uh, people are too lazy to dig deeper, they would just project their emotions on the, uh, on the people who carried the uh, ideal ideas that they hate. Mm. So uh, I think less, uh, e being less ego is very important in uh, controlling mm. its own narrative. Yeah. Actually, Glacier, I know you've been writing for a while, so do you have anything to add, especially in that context? Or uh, Yes, I, I, I do. Um, I'd say in, in the context of Hong Kong, I definitely agree with what Ray said, um, coming from m more or less a similar mindset at the time, I'd say I see the narrative and the discourse of so-called identity politics in Hong Kong changed from 2015 after the Umbrella Revolution till now, it shifted quite a lot. But one thing never changes, Hong Kong or the term Hong Kong is never defined by the way we look. It's all based on values. In 2015, Hong Kongers refer to those who embrace the idea of rule of law, of freedom, and the genuine desire for democracy. And in 2019, Hong Kongers are bound by the common suffering that we went through in 2019. And we are still wanting the same thing despite among all the sao which is hand and feet in Chinese, that means brother and sisters, we don't only have Asian faces. We have white people. We have Southeast Asian faces. We have Middle East faces. We have all sorts of ethnicity that are in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, there is a building in Tim Sa Chui called Chong Heng Dai Ha. And there is just so much cultural diversity in there, and we do see that kind of uh, 
diversity in the movement in 2019, actually in 2014 too, just not as visible as it, it, it was in 2019. So I never actually came, it never occurred to me that Hong Kongers, I am, are defined by my ethnicity as looking Asian in a way. And so I would definitely agree with what Ray said. And I think it's very important as Ray described it as well, their party managed or try, at least attempted to channel that sentiment or that momentum that came from like the discontent towards the current status quo that is something is we treasure in our communities being hindered into policy agendas. They managed to translate that kind of sentiment into a direct and clear demand that we want the government to, to navigate around some of the policy issues that, are, that were in Hong Kong that needs to be addressed instead of sticking with that sentiment. They, they, their party successfully channeled that into a policy agenda, which was amazing to see, and that is a very healthy way of do it, doing so. Of course, there are a lot of like executions behind through social media, through tech, and so on. And I think the same, it's more or less a comparable example would maybe would be the hatred towards police in 2019 mm -hmm. in Hong Kong. That Personally, I do feel that burning rage of I really don't want to talk to someone who's supportive of the police who, or is a police officer in any way because of the brutality that we see. But we managed to translate that anger into a clear message that we want an independent investigation on police brutality in 2019. And this kind of channeling kind of helps to not 100% address, but we do have a way to channel that energy towards a more healthy and a more structural way that would actually facilitate meaningful changes to happen instead of sticking with the emotions and that's all we have. Philip, before we move to audience questions, do you want to close us out on this question? Uh, sure, I think that, I mean, identity is at the center of uh, all those narratives and I think the key word for me would be to disaggregate. As we all said and in previous panels, the line of the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, is that the CCP, the Chinese government, 1.3 or 1.4 billion people are one same thing. Uh, and in the mix, forgetting all the incredible diversity and richness of overseas Chinese communities that have been living in other places for centuries. Uh, and I want to mention that because uh, before the pandemic started, I spent a year in Taiwan. And what a lot of people who are not very familiar with Taiwanese and Chinese history uh, are not aware of the fact that until uh, 1987, Taiwan was definitely not a democracy. It had martial law. Uh, it killed and tortured opponents. Uh, it refused uh, diversity. I won't get into the details. There was no recognition of the indigenous people. When you look at Taiwan today, it's of course not a perfect society, but I think that it's a successful and open one. Why? Because they have embraced this, what I would call the global Chinese identities in the plural, which means that as a Taiwanese, maybe your grandparents speak Japanese because it was under a Japanese occupation, uh, but they still identify as Taiwanese. Maybe your grandmother from, uh, was from you know, an indigenous community, Tsai Ing-wen, has you know, indigenous uh, origins in her family. Uh, and it shows us that, of course, a free Chinese community and society can be global, can deal with multiple identities and still come together and based on values, as, as both of you said, I think it's very clear today that to be a Hong Konger uh, is not related to your ethnicity, whether you only speak Cantonese or don't speak Cantonese, or you have Nepali heritage, you can claim, you know, uh, Hong Kong identity because you recognize yourself in values. The same is, is true for Taiwan, and my only wish is that this happens one day uh, in China, because China is very diverse, and Chinese people deserve that diversity reflected. Thank you. Yeah, the uh, complicated layers of Taiwanese identity are definitely something that an entirely different panel could be had on. <laughs> um, so without, with that, um, are there any questions from the audience for the panelists? There's, uh, yeah, over there. <coughs> Great, thank you um, for your presentations. I wanted to, um, ask a question and also make a quick comment, which I'd be interested to hear your response to. Uh, 
my question goes to the use of, I mean, China is famous for its 50 cent troll army and for its online information operations. And I'm curious about what the experiences were that were accumulated in Hong Kong at this level. I mean, you spoke a little bit about what was the, some of the organizational protocols that took place, particularly in the early days as the uh, demands were being developed and so on. So I'm, I'm curious to know if there were attempts made to disrupt that, and um, if there were, what mechanisms were developed to try to counter that, whether that was some sort of a relationship, you know, in terms of technical tools, or just a tighter relationship between the encounters of people in real life spaces, and in some way mirroring that online. So that's, that's my question. The um, comment that I wanted to make is, uh, uh, I've been following very closely what was going on in, in Hong Kong, and it did get, of course, some coverage in the mainstream German press. But in terms of the really mass press, I was very uh, disappointed in 2019 when uh, Joshua Wong was here in Berlin as a guest of the Build newspaper. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't know, I presume most of the people here are German, but I think for those who are not, it's uh, worth noting that the Build is a newspaper which would have regularly celebrated over decades, you know, police's repression of protests and of, you know, democratic protesters in Germany and elsewhere. And <clears throat> in the interviews which they conducted with Joshua Wong, it was very much, the, the situation in Hong Kong was very much presented as being analogous to that which Berliners had faced under the Cold War. And, you know, this kind of thing was the, in the shadow of an authoritarian regime. I'm personally no friend of authoritarian regimes and certainly not a nostalgic for, uh, the East, for East Germany. But it, it, there is no denying, if you live in Germany, what the power is of the Bild Zeitung as an amplifier. And I'm curious as to whether uh, there is much consideration in Hong Kong about some of the subtleties about the way in which the Hong Kong protest case can be perceived abroad depending upon the manner in which it's delivered. Yeah, Glacier, do you wanna? Um, I would answer the latest part of your comment first because I, I, I do feel like I am in the capacity to answer that or respond to that. When Joshua Wong was here in 2019, I was accompanying him basically. So um, the reason why he took that invitation from BUILD is that strategically, our colleagues and the whole team understood the urgency to have a voice in Europe about Hong Kong, being able to tell the narrative as we saw fit at the time. And strategically speaking, after taking into considerations in general, we decided to take that invitation and gave it a yes. And then that's why Joshua Wong flew in and everything. And at the same time, because he knew if he couldn't get out that time to say anything, he would never had the chance to travel abroad to do that again. We pretty much have like very clear like future inside that this might very well be his last visits abroad. And that's why he went to Germany and then the US. And this is why the invitation accepted. And the way Joshua Wong presented Hong Kong as being the new Berlin is a narrative that up till this point, I still feel, feel like I can resonate with. I'm not saying the two places are completely identical or comparable in many ways. But at the time when we were doing a lot of research and a lot of background checks on those things, we realized Hong Kong and Berlin were chosen to be two of the landmark cases of democratization after authoritarian regimes that have ruled parts of the whole or under, or like being placed in the crossroad of democratization. I should put it, uh, this is better. And there are a lot of studies and a lot of research trying to predict the trajectories of these two places. And no one expected Hong Kong would go down that path. So we, the team and everyone figured it would be appropriate to put it in that narrative. And 
to have it echoed by such a like broadly received newspaper, this is something we never anticipated. And I must say we might be inconsiderate in a way because we never fully understood the German context. Even though I've been here for, for now it's like two to three years, I still never, never feel comfortable to say I understand what's happening in Germany 100% because that's not going to be possible because I have my own cultural upbringing that's going to get in the way of me understanding new things. And I would, in, his, in Joshua's defense, I'd say this is the best call that we made. I understand we might not be able to satisfy everyone and every audience, but we never intended to create any sort of, um, of like offend anyone in that sense. And this is, this is the rationale behind why we make those calls. And when it comes to trolling or social media or like, trollers getting in the way of decision-making in the Hong Kong movement, I'd say I am pretty familiar with trolling. I get that a lot even in Hong Kong. Like, I think Ray would like have witnessed how I went through all of those things. And um, as an activist abroad now, uh, text saying that, hello beauty, but you are Chinese, or even dick pics, those kind of things are uh, on a normal daily basis. Like this is the entry level of being an active, female activist abroad. Um, but for the decision-making thing, I think they did get in the way somehow at the very beginning of the protest, like trying to figure itself out in a leaderless state. Uh, but then we stick to a doctrine called we do not split. So if we sense that someone or a troll is getting in the way of us trying to reach a consensus or reach a conclusion, people are implicitly ignoring that person or ignoring that kind of threat or we, we can just as well start a new thread and then continue discussion. So we don't directly engage with those things, especially on social media because it amplifies on the algorithms. So it's like we have a very, very clear mindset, the best way for social media trolls is ignore them. Don't give them the intention and don't make quote unquote like stupid people famous in a way. But on other discussions, we, we are completely aware of the fact that there are people who are not from the same side or they're from the opponents, basically, in the conversation. So people avoid sensitive topics, and when we try to make consensus, we really stick to that do not split approach. And we try our best to respect everyone, not, think, not take things personally. And this is not a strategic or technological solution. It really rely on how each of us perceive the movement, movement and how each of us perceives ourselves within the movement. We know very well that we are only facilitators. Each of us are only participants and facilitators. We don't have the power to decide for each other, that's what you're gonna do. This is not how we understand or perceive ourselves in the movement. So I don't like, I cannot give you a very concrete solution of how do, how do we build that mindset, but we kind of learn from the split or the development of discourse or the argument, the tensions that Ray brought about between the, the old pandemic mindset and the localist mindset that we kind of ev like we kind of it's like an evolution. We basically became a better version of Hong Kongers, and then we managed to solve it out that way. I hope it's satisfying. Thank you. I would like to add a few sentences on the, um, the New Berlin issue. Um, Actually, it's a very good example to show that uh, sometimes uh, narratives, uh, whether a narrative uh, is suitable, is very much de uh, dependent on the, on the context. Let's take uh, Xinjiang as an example. In Canada, in the UK, in uh, the US, the parliaments have already passed the bill to recognize the uh, human rights violations in Xinjiang is genocide. But in Germany, the things get very differently because uh, the unique history, uh, historical background in Germany, uh, even uh, the Green Party, which is the most chi uh, uh, critical on uh, human rights uh, violations in Germany, is already, they, they still think that um, we uh, German the German Parliament shouldn't recognize uh, 
the human rights violations in Xinjiang as genocide because in the context here, genocide means a systematic um, uh, extinction of whole nations and by killing them. But for, I don't know, for us maybe, of course, uh, genocide is killing a whole group of people is genocide, but what CCP is doing in Xinjiang is also a, a, a way to extinct a nation. They cleanse their uh, culture. They basically want to erase their identity, and they uh, arrested a woman to do an operation so that they couldn't reproduce their next generations. Uh, all these uh, 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 actions, uh, all these uh, things uh, serve the purpose to extend a nation, I think is very obvious. I think, I don't want to stress production. Do we have time for one more short question or? Okay, um, so we have time for two quick short questions from the audience, uh, one, okay. One quick short question, sorry, Sign it's not good at sign language. Um, preferably from someone who's not a man, that would be nice, just for balance. Any women or non-binary people in the audience feel? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for, for really pr provocative and, and really generating a lot. So I'm going to apologize in advance. This is. Um, can't be a short, but I will make it short, so then it'll just be very truncated. Yeah, because I have like two pages of things I wanted to ask you, so I guess it's not a good idea, so you're gonna get it at dinner, Philip, yeah. So I realize I'm gonna ask you all these questions. Uh, what I thought I would just say quickly, um, by way of adding um, to the, for the audience, and I hope Ray and Glacier will forgive me, you know, is I wanted to add, um, there's something that uh, they are unique of a generation, and because I belong to the generation which they said, I'm not a pandem, but that they said there were tensions, so I'm that other generation, is that um, the generation that generated um, Occupy in 2014 and 2019, their generation, were created. They came out of a special educational reform effort in Hong Kong. And they produced exactly what that education reform was going to be about. That is, young people who were critical thinkers, who were creative. They were taught to embrace music and art and, and culture and to create it as, you know, they, they did instruments. They, did, they were in the educational curriculum, had to do community service. They had to go out into the community and link it to what they were doing in the classroom. So that educational reform, which was major, created this fabulous generation, which I just love to pieces. And what they're doing now is destroying that whole education because they said, oh, good Lord, look what we produced. We can't have this, yeah? So that's why they eliminated whole chunks of that curriculum. And so I think that for the next generation, that's what I think they're struggling with, is that it's so important that it's not just that they're smart and that they're articulate and that they're committed. It's all of those capacities that produce them, you know, creative, thoughtful. And they were being a little modest that in Flow, which they've both written in, and, and I've written an intro for that journal, is in that journal, all the stuff about divisiveness and everything, you can read in every single piece the amount of respect they have for the other people in their um, movement that they profoundly disagree with. And so, uh, unfortunately, they did flow only in um, Chinese right now. So I wrote the only English intro because <laughs> I wanted to introduce it to English speaking. So you can look at the intro where I summarize kind of their pieces. But the point is that when we think about the movement and splintering and everything, what um, highlighting just what Glacia you were saying, there is this deep respect that they try to live and that they embody and that they're, they're debating among themselves, but the internal discussion is different than ever fighting out publicly, that they will respect those differences. And I just think, you know, like add oil, you know, good for you. And, um, and, and, and I'm so glad everybody's here to be interested in, and support them and support us, right? 
Yeah, sorry, it wasn't a real question, Catherine, <laughs> but I'm going to give them all the <laughs> questions later. <laughs> that was, def was definitely not a question. Yeah, maybe um, we're about to run out of time, so the, um, maybe we can have time for quick closing statements from everyone on the panel if you want to comment, or is... We can also go out on this note if you want. That's, uh, that also seems fine to me. So yeah, so in the interest of not stressing out production too much and leaving time for a break before the next panel, um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, this is very interesting. Um, and I really appreciate you all being here. And nice round of applause for the whole panel, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, you, you can wait a little second because I'm here to introduce uh, briefly the next panel. Uh, we will be here at uh, 6.30 with the panel uh, Surveilling the Surveillance State with Simone Pierani and Jack Paulson. So please, I tell everybody to come back here. And uh, also, I want to thank you very much for this very interesting panel, also very important. Thank you. <laughs>